this is a term that many of us know. There's different levels of generosity. There's those people who are generous sometimes. Those, there's people out there that walk in generosity like their whole life, and they're really good at it. They're really good people. And generosity is great, but generosity um, is something that is sometimes can miss, uh, can miss out on a key ingredient, and that's God. Some of you, I know good people in my life. Like, I have good people in my life. I have, I have family members in my life that are really good, but they don't know Jesus. A lot of times we think because we're so good, that because we give, because we're generous, that that kind of solidifies our walk with Christ. But, but we're going we're gonna to talk about that this morning. We're going to talk about generosity according to the Word of God and what it says because a lot of times we, we miss how good God is and how great he is. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So, um, you know, it's funny how, how, good, how good God is. He's so good, he doesn't make you, right? He doesn't make you do anything. You, you get to with God. You get to, to receive Jesus in your life. You get to do these things. And, man, I, I love that about Jesus. That's one of my favorite things about being a Christian is that I'm not forced to do this. Yes, maybe as a toddler, I was forced to come to church. My parents set me down, and, and you know, uh, I used to build forts with the hymnals and the, in the seat, and my dad would crush them, and then, <laughs> and then I'd get all upset, but then whatever. But it was fun, you know, like church was still fun. And, uh, yeah, I was forced, but I get to go to church. I get to be a part of, of Jesus. I get to do this, and that's what's so awesome about being a Christian. So I start, I start going. I'm, I'm going to set all this up for you before I get right, really deep down in generosity. So there's a few scriptures we have to set ourselves up with here. But, but um, I think about the Garden of Eden quite a bit. That's something that's, you'll hear me maybe time, time and time again bring it up. The Garden of Eden always is, is fascinating to me. It's fascinating the beginning of time, man and woman, Adam and Eve, hanging out in the garden. And, and God gives them a chore chart of sorts, right? He gives them, hey, you can eat of all of these fruits, you can do all of this stuff, but just not this one tree here. Just stay away from this one tree. And it's so like us in our human nature to actually want to explore, want to see adventure, want to push the limits, right? And it's, it's just who we are, and that's how God made us. But in God making us this way, he gave us a choice. So we had a choice to see if this fruit was worthy of us, you know, or, or, or is it really that good? What does it mean? <coughs> Excuse me. So I, I look at this story, and I think, man, you had it so easy. Adam and Eve, you had it easy. I mean, God threw you a lob. He lobbed you the easiest chore chart on all the planet, thousands of trees, but one, right? How easy. He set you up for good. He set you up for a life that would be great, but instead, what did you do? You went and took of this fruit. So that leads me to the next part of this, this story. Um, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And it starts with verse 41, but I'm going I'm to uh, paraphrase it and then get into it. But there's this, this is Jesus at a young age. This is one of the only stories we have of Jesus at a young boy age. And this is fantastic. And what's happening is, is his family traveled, and they traveled, and they did this every year. And this was the festival, the Passover festival. And they did this every single year. They traveled to Jerusalem, and they would do this in caravans of people because it was always safer to travel this way. Uh, so the pirates of that day wouldn't come in and attack a smaller group. So they would, they would travel in huge groups. So in traveling and leaving from the Passover festival, uh, Mary and Joseph had just assumed that Jesus was in the back somewhere hanging out with friends, uh, um, you know, playing whatever. And they started acknowledging the fact that Jesus wasn't showing himself. And this was weird. Jesus was pretty good at coming around. And being made known of, hey, mom and dad, I'm over here type of moment. So they were getting really scared. So they started searching and searching and searching. So that leads us to verse 46. And it says, three days 
Later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So we'll stop right there. I just need to help you guys with this because this is a misconception that a lot of folks always hear the teaching and the message that Jesus was teaching in the temple. Actually, Jesus wasn't teaching per se in the temple. What was happening was that Jesus was listening and that's what young scribes would do. They would listen to the, the, the teachers of that day, and then they would ask questions. Now, we know through Jesus and his uh, adulthood, we learned throughout the Gospels, that Jesus actually was a really good uh, interrogator. He was someone who would ask questions. Now, the reason why he asked questions is because he's trying to bring out truth. He's trying to bring out substance. What is it that you really believe? Tell me. I'm asking you. Jesus was always really good at it. And there were even times where you would think that Jesus was smarter, like, I don't know if Jesus was technically smart, Alec, but I would say that Jesus was just trying to get to the root of truth. I do believe Jesus had a joking side to himself about certain, certain moments. I want to believe um, the best of Jesus because we have to, uh, but there are those moments I want to think that Jesus asked a question and turned his back and was like, <laughs> just because it was such a good question, you know, it would catch people up where they'd go, wow, how good. How, wow, who is this guy before me? Like, is he the Savior? Who, who is Jesus? And that's the type of questions he would ask to get you to that place. It was really awesome. So here's Jesus as a boy in the temple asking questions, and his parents stumble upon him in the temple, and they actually take a step back to observe what's going on as well. It wasn't like they just came in and being like, Jesus, where are you? Come here. You know, it's one of those things. But no, it was kind of like they even observed because they were astonished by what was taking place. He was asking questions, but in him even asking questions, he was teaching through his questions. He was actually bringing a wealth of knowledge and wisdom beyond his age. And even the people were, everyone that was around was astonished. The teachers themselves were astonished by this of like, wow, I can't believe what he's asking. And in his asking, I'm learning. This is, this is astonishing. So his parents acknowledged that. So in verse 47, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Verse 48, his parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. He said, didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Now, this is great. You can quickly read through it and you're like, this is so good. I'm great. That's great. It's good. But here at this church, we've learned we do not do that. We are good Bereans. We want to stop. We want to observe the scriptures. We want to look to see what it says, dissect it a little bit more, open it up to say, whoa, what does this word mean? And how does it equate to this word? And look at all the different stories within the Bible. So that's how we studied here at Charlotte Church. We want the fullness, the real, the real correct answer. So if we stop and we finish that story, we're missing it. We're missing out on some key stuff. Verse 49, but why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? This was the first moment that this was ever, ever addressed this way. Now, people would acknowledge that God being the father of the nation, the father of all things, that was common back then. But for Jesus, in the very first time, and it is recorded here in the book of Luke, that he addresses God as his father in my father's house. And this is awesome because then it brings us to John chapter 1. So turn your Bible to John chapter 1 in verse 12 and verse uh, and 13. In John chapter 1, if you notice, if you read this, John's given us a great synopsis of, of just who Jesus is, how he's manifested in the word. The word is him. He is the word. He is God. All that kind of stuff. It's so good, really good. You can get a wealth of knowledge just out of chapter 1 of John. But we're going to talk about verses 12 through 13, and it says this. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Okay, this is good, and I got to reread this again, and I'll, and I'll go a little slower. Verses 12, but to all who believed him and accepted him, all who believed Jesus and accepted him, 
He gave the right to become children of God. Why did he give, he, why did he give the right? He was the only one able to give a right because he was actually the son of God. So therefore, he was able, once accepting Jesus, able to give you the new birthright to say, hey, you're a part. You're a, child, you're a child of God. You are the children of God. And so they are reborn, not with the physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So he's talking about good here. He's actually talking about the good nature of God. And that's what we're talking about this morning, generosity, the goodness of God. So he says resulting from human passion or plan. Because, see, that's what we think, right? I mean, we think we're good. We think we're so good. Human passion and plan, our own selves. We did this. You know, you look upon your children like they're my children. (laughs) You know, I did it. It's like, God. But a birth that comes from God. My oldest son, Cademan, he's a lot of fun. He's a lot of fun. He's like, he's like preteen right now, you know. He's like, oh, man. He's not preteen. He's only 10, but, man, he's so smart, too good, too smart for his own good, you know. So um, he comes to me, and he says, hey, Dad, uh, I want an allowance. <laughs> Why do you want an allowance? He says, because I, I want money. What do you want to buy, son? I want anything I want. <laughs> you think I'm just going to let you buy anything you want once you get an allowance? I, yeah, you know. And I, but, son, you're going to have to do chores. He said, right, I'll do chores. You give me allowance. I said, you don't do chores now. He goes, well, I will because I'll get money. So, but you should do chores because you want to, because right now you're being fed. I even started getting to the place where I was like, oh, so you're going to do chores. You want allowance, so I'm going to start charging you for dinner. <laughs> my dad's like, no. Or my dad, sorry, my dad. My, Kate, my son's like, no, dad, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I said, so what do you want to do? He said, you know, I'll make my bed. You don't make your bed now, son. He said, yeah, because you don't pay me. <laughs> how much do you want to make? How much, how, much, how much do you think making a bed's worth? Dollar. <laughs> I said, a bed's worth a penny. I said, a dollar's when you start washing your sheets and folding them. <laughs> That's worth a dollar. He gets all mad, right? He's getting all mad and heated inside. Like, no, it's worth, it's worth a dollar. It's worth a penny. You make your bed. <laughs> Crazy, right? You know what's funny? It's funny how he wants to make money, and that's good. I admire that about him. But at the same time, he thinks that he's these chores that he wants. When right now, he gets anything he wants, not spoiled, brat anything, but he gets most of what he wants in reason. He gets to eat, right? He gets good clothes. We take care of him. Matter of fact, he's actually the, like the royal son of, of the family because why? He gets no hand-me-downs, <laughs> right? Granted, there are some of you in this, in this church who've actually blessed my children with your, your children's hand-me-downs, and I appreciate that and thank you. Otherwise, my children probably would be half-naked right now. <laughs> but, but he is actually the son, right? It's his brothers who get all the hand-me-downs, poor kids. <laughs> so I look at Cademan, and I go, Cademan, you are rich beyond measure right now. You don't need to do this. I don't think I want you to have a chore chart because you'll never be able to manage that chore chart. You will never be able to measure up to that chore chart, ever. There might be moments that you kind of touch the, like the hem of how awesome you could be. But you will never, ever be able to do this chore chart the way I want you to do this chore chart. Dad, come on, man. Come on. It's just like Adam and Eve, right? It's just like Adam and Eve. This idea of we can do it. And because we are good, because we're so good, we should be rewarded. See, Adam and Eve had this misconception in their head that they were so good that they could choose what's good for them. They had that right. Yeah, God gave us some rules, but I I can choose for myself what's good. I have that ability. I'm so good. 
And that's what my, my children are thinking, my son. He's thinking, well, Dad, I want to be rewarded for my good. Son, you're, you are being rewarded for your good now. I'm letting you live. <laughs> right? I'm letting you live in my house. That's good enough. But there's something deeper about all of this because my son's actually teaching me a lesson right now of goodness of God. How good is God? How good is he? Man, he's, I can't even equate to this. I mean, my son's trying to, to make me happy. You know, that's what my son's thinking in his head. I will make you happy and you reward me. You will never, no matter even what you do, I will still love you. No matter what you do, I will still think you're good. No matter what you do, I will still dote on you and I will still take care of you. I will still wash your, your dirty underwear, you know, like the dirtiest of things. I will do those things for you because I love you. You're my son, period. That never stops. But here it's like, reward me, though. So that brings me into a phenomenal story, and this is the heart of the message. And we find this, and it's entitled in different, different translations, but we find it in Luke chapter 18, and we also find it in Mark chapter 10. But it's titled The Rich Young Ruler. Now, some of you will see in NIV, KJV, or in different other translations, you'll see a religious leader, uh, a young religious leader, a young leader. You'll see different things, but it's a rich young ruler is what it is. Now, I'm going to bust through this thing. And then we're going to stop, and I'm going to break it down, okay? So I'm going to read it, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to break it up, okay? So here we go. So Luke chapter 18, uh, verses 18 through 30. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit the eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother, the man replied. I've obeyed all these commands since I was young. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, there's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad. For he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, Then who in the world can be saved? He replied, What is, it, what is impossible for people is possible with God. Peter said, We've left our homes to follow you. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of this kingdom, for the sake of the kingdom of God, will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Okay, I busted through it. Now we're going to go back. And actually, we're going to start at the end. Now, what's funny about this is a lot of us, some of you just regurgitated in your head of your past messages you've heard pastors preach all of a sudden it's come up and you're like, oh, yeah, the rich. But yet you, many of you still play the lottery. <laughs> Ouch, right? Like you guys, that was so good. None of you burned right now. And then like, that was a good burn right on you. Because some of you in this room are like, yeah, rich, man, rich people. But then you try to play the lottery to become rich. It just makes no sense whatsoever. Now, before I go any further, I do need to say this message is for me this morning. It's for all of us in this room. Now, I know this message is for me. A lot of these messages I preach are for me. Now, some of you can sit here and you can say, oh, Pastor Josh, you're full of it. You were thinking about me, weren't you? And, and, and you can get in this head, like, conundrum to think, oh, yeah. Pastor Josh thinks he's so holy and mighty up here preaching this message, and he's just got it all together. I don't, all right? Not even like a little bit do I have this all together. I'm preaching this message for me as well. Matter of fact, actually, I'm the one who actually edits this video at the end and reposts it on our website, so I watch it a second time. I'm better than you. <laughs> I'm only kidding. That was only a funny jab. I'm just kidding. I'm not better than you. That's what I'm preaching about this morning. But I would encourage you this morning not to let the enemy come creeping in your thoughts 
and to try to drive a wedge in your head about what's good and money. And then obviously you're thinking, oh, here's a pastor who wants to talk about money. No, 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 get that out of your head as well. I'm not talking about money. I'm actually talking about a position and a posture to find yourself in. And if you've been here for a while, I've been talking about this for over a month and a half now to two months. That position and that posture you've got to find yourself in when you come into the presence of God. And that's what generosity is all about right now. A lot of us get misconceived in these notions of goodness, of like, oh, I'm good because I give. And so therefore I should be rewarded. But that's not the case. Or I should get a pat on my back. And some of you actually are saying, no, 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 I, I am. I just, I don't want to be seen. I just want to give and, and do it. But my other question is, do you give for what God's telling you to give? Are you doing what he's doing? Or are you just giving because it is good? Because don't get me wrong, giving's good. But there's something different about when you give when God tells you to give versus I just give because it's the good thing to do. We can do that. It's like the guy who rings the bell with the Salvation Army thing, right? You're like, blah, 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 blah. you're like checking your pockets for change just because it's like, I better give because I hear the bell. It's like Pavlov, you know? It's like you hear the bell, give, you know? It's like, I better give. And that's great. But that's not necessarily God's goodness of generosity. So, starting the end here. This is really a fun story. You could read this and go to bed at the end of the night and feel all warm and fuzzy, or you could stop and you could act all this out. And, I, and I'm, I know some of you say, well, I'm Josh, I'm, I'm an introvert. Uh, you're not an introvert when you're in your bedroom with the door closed because you dance probably in your underwear and you know it. <laughs> so don't even. And if I'm the only one who dances in my underwear, then you're all jacked up, okay? <laughs> But I'm going to tell you right now, we all are extroverts. So when you read into this, I want you to act it out. Think about this. So we get real hung up on this eye of the needle thing, this kingdom of God and the eye of the needle and, and, and giving and have these rich people. You know, these rich, stinking people, they should just give it out. We should spread out the wealth to everybody. Yeah, they don't know. they're going to go to hell in a handbasket. Arr, you know. And we, I don't know if you've ever grown up with this teaching, but remember, I'm going to tell you right now, if you, if you don't give to the, to, the, to the poor, and if you don't give everything that you own away, then you're going to go to hell. <laughs> no one else grew up with a guy like that? <laughs> Just me? Just me? Only I grew up? Really? Only me? <laughs> anyway. But we get this teaching that we've got to be poor as Christians. But that's, that's actually miscommunicated. But then on the other side of the coin, Peter, and I'm not preaching a prosperity message, so just hold back all your hate mail. Peter, <laughs> Peter in verse 28 says, like seriously, I'm trying to get an acting moment in your head because I can see Peter hearing this and going, um, we've left our, our homes to follow you. Uh, yes, Jesus replies. And I assure you that everyone has given up house Anyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for this sake of the kingdom of God will, re be, will be repaid many times over in this life, this life, this life, and will have eternal life in the world to come. So he was actually correcting Peter. Some of you think, oh, Peter was just hanging out, right? Just kind of like, yeah, so what a... Peter was actually the opposite of the rich guy. Peter was actually like, hey, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, whoa. We've given it all. Well, what about us? <laughs> I'm going back to my childhood. And obviously, you guys had a horrible childhood. <laughs> when you give to the kingdom of God and you give it all away, you will get crowns upon glory and jewels upon that crown. No, no one? No one? Just, okay, Kelly? Okay, a few other. Because they preach this message of like this idea, if you give it all away, if you're rich, you need to give it away, but you'll have crowns of glory in the kingdom of God, and it'll be jewels for everything you do. And you're like, Because hmm? that's what Peter's probably envisioning right now, like, oh, so I'm going to be poor here on earth. But Peter's kind of sitting here also with the attitude of like, because I can see his face at that moment of like, we've left everything, so what's that mean for us, God? Like, I don't have a retirement fund. I don't have insurance. I don't have anything, God. 
Like, Jesus, I gave it all away. Like, I, threw my, I like left my boat floating in the sea. Like, who knows who picked it up? And Jesus is like, We've, we, I get it. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Again, a position of generosity on both sides. It's the position and the posture you find yourself with God, with what you're doing with your generosity. It's not a matter of this idea of how much money you have or how little you have. It's a matter of what are you doing for God. Now, a lot of times we get real hung up on the doing factor, and so that brings us up to the very beginning. Now, this rich young ruler, he hears Jesus from the distance, right? He's hanging out in the crowd. He's observing. He's probably seen him a few times, you know, seen the miracles, the signs, and the wonders, kind of hanging out, observing. So Jesus starts walking. You actually, in other, other stories within the New Testament, you hear that the rich young ruler caught up to him. So imagine, hey, Jesus, you're so fast. Jesus is like, I've got things to do, places to be. I'm about to walk on water. You want to walk on water with me? <laughs> this guy's like, what? Seriously, this is what's going on, right? Jesus got to go. He's got to do things. Guy catches up to him and says, hey, I got a question for you, Jesus. He says, well, what's the question? He said, good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do, you, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him, only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Um, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I read the Old Testament. You, 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 the Old Testament you, know, you know the Old Testament. This is a guy who had to memorize it from birth, right? Charles, you know it, right? You know the, I counted five. Now, if you read in Mark's translation, Mark actually throws in another uh, commandment that he throws. Now, it's not a commandment. It's actually it tags on to falsely with your brother because I believe that Mark was trying to say that this rich ruler, um, Jesus was throwing it out there to say to him, like, you didn't earn your money through uh, stealing from others, like false falsehood, you know, conniving type of ways. So it goes into the same commandment, but he says five commandments. You know what five actually is? Five Five is actually the number of grace. So Jesus is talking to him in grace. He's talking to him in grace. Now, before I go any further with all of this, we actually have to read after the commandments to get a position of where Jesus is with this guy. So in Mark, and in chapter, uh, in chapter 10, in Mark chapter 10, in verse 21, it says, Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. That's great. That's how good Jesus is, right? He felt genuine love. But let's go back up here to Luke. I like reading Luke's story with it. So he says, don't you know the commandments? And he names off five. Jesus names off the five easiest. Seriously, think about it. The five easiest commands. Don't kill. Got it. <laughs> How many people in that day? Now, granted, yes, there were some thugs out there, and there were some crazy people that killed people. Duh. But seriously, killing someone, not that hard to avoid, you know? Like, not something that, that's really that hard. The stealing factor, sure. But Jesus, deep down inside, knew that this punk kid was kind of like, well, I've obeyed all those. I know all those. I've done them since a child. I was good. Jesus is like, <laughs> You're so full of yourself. Jesus knows he's full of himself. He's saying it. He's like, what? So he says, you know, with love, right? With love. He looked upon him with love. It's compassion. He knew that this kid didn't keep all Ten Commandments because it couldn't be fulfilled. That's the doctrine of the whole Bible. The reason why we as Christians call ourselves Christian, that we're Christ-like, because Jesus died on the cross because the chore chart couldn't be fulfilled. But Jesus did fulfill the chore chart so that we could live, live in abundance, right? So Jesus fulfilled these, but out of grace gives the five easiest ones. But every, everyone in their right mind is sitting around there like, 
kid, come on. You're so, you're so sure of yourself. But then Jesus says in verse 22, when Jesus heard his answer, he said, there's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the man heard this, he became very, very sad, for he was very rich. You know what he says in other translations as you read it? He says he had a lot of possessions. He had a lot of possessions. He owned a lot of stuff. He owned a lot of stuff. Isn't that sad? That he owned all this stuff but could not give it up. And we get in there, and that's a good, solid message, but there's more to this. Because we got to go to the beginning now. In the very beginning, he comes running up to Jesus, and he says to him, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. Do you know why Jesus asked it this way? Jesus was actually asking him an interrogation type of moment. Why do you call me good? So the guy probably dumbfounded, like, oh, just, just the thing to say. You know why he called him good? Because the rich young ruler actually thought that you could be good. He actually thought he could be good. That he himself, the rich young ruler, could be good. Why? Because he didn't know Jesus. He didn't know Jesus. Because if he would have known Jesus, he would have turned everything over to him. He would have given it all away, right? So if he would have known Jesus, he would have been like, yeah, I'll give my stuff away. I don't want it. It's possession. It's just junk. It's going to burn up. I don't care about that stuff. I'll follow you, Jesus, because I know who you are. You're about to walk on water. But instead, what's he say? Oh, I can't. I'm so sad. I can't. I got, I got a lot of stuff. It's like, what do you mean you have a lot of stuff? It's really hard to have a lot of stuff and be generous for God's kingdom. Because, see, Jesus knew that he didn't know who Jesus really was. So for him to call Jesus good, even though Jesus is good, Jesus is the epitome of good. He is our example of good. But in his own human thinking, the rich young ruler thought that he was good. That's the problem with humanity. We think we're good. We think that we're good. We think we can produce what's good. You know, I'll get done with this message. And, and every Sunday in the past, people come up, some people come up to me and say, man, that was a good message. Thanks. I've had people come up to me, send me emails, and tell me that was an awful message. They say, I don't like what you said there. And I take it, and I go, well, I got somebody who tells me I'm good. I got somebody who tells me I'm bad. And I look at it, and I go, Pfft. why? Because it doesn't matter what you think is good. It's what matter what God thinks is good. I was actually a bass player. No offense, Clayton, I'm sorry, but the bass player is the lamest instrument on this on this stage. I was a bass player for my church back home, right? And I would play the bass. People come up to me and be like, hey, you play the bass. And I'm like, yeah, I play the bass. It's four strings. It's the easiest instrument to play. Now, if, if I played the piano, I'd maybe be a little bit more like, yeah, I play the piano. You know, but I have no idea. I mean, even goes with our animal in his cage right here. <laughs> this guy's a beast, right? I have no idea how to play drums. I, I look like a moron up there. I'm just banging around on things. But I play the bass. I mean, I just think that, like this humble, like this moment of like, yeah, I play. Yeah, I play. Jesus is so proud of me. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous way of thinking that because what we do, God's so, he's so pleased with it. God is so good. Actually, he doesn't care about any of that stuff. He just loves us. And that's the reason why we continue to keep falling into sin at those moments that we've puffed ourselves up of how good we are. But yet then when sin comes in, we kind of get all this moment of we can't go to church, we can't be there, we can't, can't be in, in the presence of God because it's just, I'm not good right now. You're never good. No one in this room is good. What you've got to acknowledge is your position and posture with God to acknowledge that he's the one who's good and to say, gosh, you're so good to me. You love me. You're so good to me, God. So we actually even want to try to witness, try to bring people in our church, but man, Trailhead Church is awesome. Trailhead Church isn't awesome. True church smells just like every other church. We all smell, all right? The only good thing is we don't have a graveyard on the outside. Dead on the inside, dead on the outside. What? <laughs> I know, right? That's really awful to say. 
But, but everyone wants to be like, church, your church is so good. No, our church isn't good. God's so good. If we got into a position where we started talking to people to invite them out, rather than saying, man, my church is awesome. We got good worship. Some of you are visiting for the first time this morning trying to find a church, and you got a checklist, and you're like, worship okay, worship good. you got like little columns. It's mediocre. <laughs> Pastor Josh, he's kind of funny. He entertains me. Not put a note there on the side about that. I don't know. He hasn't used the 15 scriptures that I require. If we start putting this good on a particular thing, whether it's good or not, but you're missing the point. When we go out to witness to others in our community here in Graham and Alamance County in North Carolina and the United States, the world, the ends of the earth, as God has instructed us to do so, we don't say how good the things that we're doing in here. We talk about how good God is and how he's so good to me. What's God, do, what's God doing to, for you right now? Oh, man, God's so good. Do you imagine if you walked up to people and was like, hey, yeah, you should come to Trailhead Church. I play the bass. We're pretty awesome. <laughs> and they're like, well, that's cool. Yeah, you should come to my church. I play the bass, man. It'll be fun. You can come in and hang out with us. Hey, yeah, I did this. I did that. Yeah, I, uh, I, I greet people. I'm out in the parking lot with the big blue finger. I'm awesome. I think that's what get, my church is funny. They're really cool. They're hip. We're so far from hip. I looked at a magazine to look like this. You know what I mean? I didn't come up with this idea. I saw this on Pinterest because I'm half girl. <laughs> what we do is, is we point out of how good God is, right? God is so good to me. That's when we get out there and we say, God is so good to me. Let me tell you how good he is. Man, that's where you should be, that position and that posture of, man, God's so good. Because this guy clearly didn't know, and that's why Jesus was saying, why do you call me good? Do you know who I am? Wow, you know who I am. So out of grace, he says, you know the commandments? You do. You, do, you know them? You've done them? Those five? That's, man, that's fantastic. There's actually one more that's important. Sell it all. Follow me. Now do you know me? Do you really realize how good I am? And then Peter, in his own ignorance, is always. <laughs> Glenn knows Peter. <laughs> Peter, what about, what about us? What about us that's given everything? God's like, you're, you're still missing it, Peter. I'm so good. God is so good that even when you fall into the posture and the position of being with me in my presence, I'll take care of you. Many times we want to get into this generosity mode of like offerings coming up here in like five minutes. We'll take up offering. And in your head, you're already kind of spilling around of like, what's in my wallet? I got five bucks. It's pretty good, five bucks. I'm going to give 100 bucks today. I'm going to give 200. I'm going to give 2,000. I'm going to give $20,000. What should I give? You get in this mindset of what should I give? What should I give? What should I give? How should that even be a, like a thought of ours where it's just a matter of, hey, Oh, whatever, God, what do you want me to do? You, you kind of, you go back and forth. I've gone back and forth. I'm not perfect. I'm trying to tell you here. This message is for me as well. There's those moments I kind of like I teeter. How much do I give this morning? How much do I give? How much do I give? I've laid out my checkbook in front of me. I love checks. I like checks better than cash. I like checks better than anything because there's more thought behind the check, all right, because you're writing it out. I'm sitting there, and I look at the check, and I put my hands over the top of it. You don't have to. There's nothing biblical about that, but I just do it. God, what do you want me to give this morning? Paul tells me to give cheerfully, not grudgingly. Give me sacrifice to give regularly. So God, what do you want me to give? And I pray about it. What's really bad is, is that God doesn't tell my wife and I um, that, that he told us. There's been multiple times I've given money, and then Anna's given money too. And it's the same amount. I gave it first service. She goes, well, I gave it second service. Well, we didn't need to give twice. She goes, well, God didn't tell us that. You, God didn't tell me you gave already, but I knew how much to give. Isn't that funny? God works funny. He's funny. He's a funny guy. <laughs> <coughs> but I pray over the offering. This is it. This is it. This is what God wants me to give, right? It's good. And then I rip it off and fold it in half and I throw it in the offering bucket because I don't care. A lot of us will pull out our wallet here in a little bit and you're going to be like, $10? Look, everybody, I'm like the widow. You are not even close to the widow. You're like, I forgave it all. You didn't give it all. 
You know way you gave it all. You're a liar. Revelation 21 8 tells me liars go to hell. <laughs> when you would sit here and be like, oh, you're crazy. Every one of you crazy. What you need to recognize is, is how good God is. And so in this position, in that posture, you go, man, God, I'm, so, I'm just so pleased to be in your presence. Nothing I can do can please you. So, God, how much? I can't outgive you. That's why you hear churches say that. Our church says you can't outgive God. That's not a prosperity message. That's just saying how good God is. I am burning up. Please turn on some air. <laughs> All right. Please, please, God. I don't, I don't even sweat, and I'm actually sweating right now. <laughs> oh, man. But, guys, God is so good. He's so good. So when you start giving, I've ever seen a lot of people get all hung up on money. God, Jesus talks about money more than anything. And my message this morning is not even about money, even though I'll tell you what the old Baptist pastor said. <laughs> I won't do it that way. You'll know a man's heart by looking in his wallet. And the reason is, is because you're generous. The generosity of not how good and how much I give, but the generosity of knowing, hey, God's so good to me. Oh, he's so good to me. You can't outgive God. God's so good. That's what it's all about. And so we, this day, we have a choice to, to be made. How generous do we want to be? So I'll sum it up with this last story. It's my favorite person in the Bible, favorite person. Stephen. And you find him in Acts chapter 6. And he was chosen. He was chosen out of a multitude of people. And he was chosen. He was a man. He was a man. A man. He was a man, just like you and me. All right? He was a man full of God's grace and power. That's what it says about him. Pretty awesome. They didn't like him. There was a lot of people who didn't like him. Jews did not like this guy. And why did they not like him? Because he was, a, he was powerful in God's grace and power. He had a lot of influence. He was actually coming up. He was awesome. He was definitely the next Paul, actually, I would say. I would go on to say. He's someone of that stature. He would have done some great, mighty things for the kingdom for sure. But they didn't like him, so they, they set a trap. They took, they took some people to tell lies about him. So they brought him into like a courtroom of sorts. They brought him down in front of all these people, and they had people lying on his behalf, telling him he was a liar and that, and that he was saying these treacherous things about the Moses and about the law and about Jesus. And actually, he stands up before the people, and this is so beautiful. He stands up before the people, and he, his face was bright like an angel. Now, some of us can look at this and is a figuratively speaking, speaking is a poetic justice of the author, is he saying how bright Stephen was and everything about the power of God? Or was he actually bright like the radiance that Moses felt from getting from up there on the mountain, right? Yes. As a matter of fact, it was just like the author saying, he turned bright. Now here, now am I just crazy? I don't know about you. Now I know I know the Bible and the Bible has truth in it and I see the very end of it and it's really easy for me to be like, why don't you believe in Jesus? It's so good. It's awesome. You know, it's really easy for us to see that. Back then, on the other hand, people, uh, for some reason, they, they didn't have this, this, the New Testament side, and you had people teaching this. So here they are, and, and here's Stephen. Before he's about to address the courtroom, his face lights up. There is nothing in my body that could cause my face to, to light up. Nothing. No one in this room can glow like a glow worm. No one. No one. Squeeze your tummy. Michelle, you squeeze your tummy, you're going to glow? No, ain't nobody going to glow. Nobody. But all of a sudden in this courtroom, he starts glowing, and they're okay with that. Totally okay with him glowing. Sitting there looking at him from the distance going, this kid's glowing. Don't like him. He's no good. You know why they kept with this? They kept with this stubbornness because they thought they were so good, that they were so good and they were so right, and that's why they were coming against this guy. I'm pretty sure at that very moment, kid starts glowing in front of me. He's good. There's something about that. This is God moment. He's glowing like an angel, they said. So what's he do? He teaches about the chore chart. He teaches about Ten Commandments. He teaches about Moses. 
And he's actually bringing it to a teaching the same way I'm doing it this morning. He's more elegant, though. But he's saying it to say, and Jesus fulfilled the law, and that's salvation. And today you can choose the salvation. Boy, they didn't like it. Matter of fact, they started to bring out stones, and they were going to stone him. So what happens when we see it here in Acts chapter 7, verse 59? And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Talk about generosity. Talk about that position and that posture with God. That in this moment of knowing you're right, listen, I get ticked off when someone cuts me off on the interstate. I'm, my son's down looking down at something in the front seat. Somebody will cross over and I go, what in the world is that guy thinking? And my son goes, where? What guy? <laughs> like my son, like what are you going to do? <laughs> like, where? I'm like, what in the world? But we do this kind of stuff. Some of you, you can't, the, someone crosses you wrong in your workplace. You're like, how can I burn their desk? <laughs> like what can I do? Like that's human nature to want to get back, revengeful, all this stuff, right? It's our way of, of, of getting and making things right. Because that's what these guys were doing against Stephen. They wanted things back right. Because why? Because they were conniving liars that were using God's commandments for their glory and for their back pockets. And unfortunately, they were missing the answer. They were the rich trying to go through the eye of the needle. And Stephen comes in with generosity saying, just give it to God. God's so good. He's so good to me. And at that very moment in his dying words, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What generosity, right? He's getting stoned. His skull's getting crushed in by stones. He's bleeding everywhere. And a stone is coming at his face. At his body, and he says to everyone in that room, he could have easily stood up and shot lightning bolts out of his eyeballs and fried everyone and then just walked out going, yeah! (laughs) Some of you are like, no, he couldn't have. I don't know, but it seems like he had that type of power, God's power, right? A man full of God's grace and power. Just take out the grace, and then it's like, but what's he do? He doesn't do that, right? falls down to his knees, and he asks God to forgive them, for they do not know, because they do not have a revelation of how good you are, God. But I'm going to show them. I believe in my whole heart that that day that Saul, who turns into Paul later on, he was in that room that day. Matter of fact, many of the people who were throwing their stones that day laid their robes at Saul's feet. And Saul observed all of this taking place. I believe that Saul was affected by Stephen. Maybe not right there in that moment, but I guarantee you that that Paul, Saul turned into Paul, reflected upon that moment for years to come, reflecting on how generous Stephen was, how he understood generosity and how he understood forgiveness and grace and how he's laid down his life for the betterment to say, God is so good to me. He's so good. So I come to you this morning and I ask, where's your generosity? Where's your position? Where's your posture? Are you willing to give it all to God? Are you willing to say, God, whatever you want? And again, it's not about how good you are. It's not about how, what you do for the kingdom of God. It's not about that. It's about your position to say, God, I'm open for whatever you want me to do. God, I'll do it. I'm not look, seeking glory. I'm not seeking honor in this. I just want you. I want you. That's all I want. Where are you with this? generosity. Let's pray.